Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. If you're a visitor with us this morning, in the chairs in front of you, you'll see one of these Connect cards. If you would fill that out for us, please, we would appreciate it and drop it in the offering trays as they go by. Or there's a basket out uh, in the front foyer area just as you come up the stairs where you can put them in. And there's also a gift out there that we'd like you to pick up and make sure you take home with you. Uh, next Sunday uh, is the beginning of Ad Advent. This is a great time to invite friends or neighbors to the church. This also means it is a time to decorate the building for Christmas. Thank you to those who signed up to, uh, to decorate today after the service. On December 8th, we will have a short business meeting to approve missions budget for 2025. Um, and copies of that proposed budget are on the table right in the back, back of the sanctuary here, right next to the offering box. Also on December 8th, our women's Christmas party is from 6 to 8. Karaoke and cookies. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and then uh, annual Salvation Army Red Kettle Drive is coming up. Info is located in the hub room right over here. If you want more information on um, the Red Salvation Army Red Kettle Drive, um, okay. Let's uh, go ahead and stand, and we'll say our memory verse. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Go ahead and have a seat, and we'll have our missions moment. I want to tell you this morning about one of the missionaries that we support. His name is Marvin Cowan, and he has begun a ministry in Salt, and well, around the Salt Lake, Utah area, since 19 in the 1960s. He is in his late 90s, and he's still actively working uh, in support of the five, at least the five active churches that are still going that he has formed around the Salt Lake City area uh, since that time. His life is, is interesting. His relatives were Mormons, pioneers, who helped settle Utah. His parents were sealed, sealed together to, and to their children for eternity in a Mormon temple ceremony. Marvin was ordained a deacon in the Aaronic er, er, priesthood at the usual age of 12. Later, while trying to convert others, serious questions were raised which caused him to study the Bible. And through that, he received Christ as his Savior. He earned a Ministry of Divinity degree from Denver Seminary in 1960, and he was appointed to the Mission to the Americas. That's known as Missions Doors now. They, that's the, the name they call themselves in 1961. That's how long he's been on the field. He, ma he married his wife, Jan, in 1956, and they raised four children in, on, on the mission field. They began uh, when, from Denver Seminary, the students began, after they had taken their training, three of the students began churches in the Salt Lake City area in Utah because those who belonged to a church and thought they were right with God needed to know the salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone. And so the churches that they started are continuing and have continued. 
Uh, he is also an author. He has written many books, and the first one was on Mormon Claims Answered. And if you would like to know anything about their religion and how they compare with Christianity, he is a wonderful author who loves the Mormon people and wants them to know Jesus Christ. And so, uh, as, as many others, uh, there are many religious people who don't know Jesus Christ, and then that they, they need to know him. And so that's been his mission. Uh, in his last letter in October 20, uh, this, of this year, he talks about some of the churches uh, in West Valley, Utah, the Sunrise Baptist Church, the Sandy Ridge Community Church, and the Intermountain Baptist Church in Taylorville. He's, he talks about some of the ministries in the Intermountain Baptist Church, and he says that they handle the Taylorville Food Pantry. This is some of their outreach. And they, were, they helped to feed a 1,000 needy people with food each week. Some of the ministries that go on in, in all the areas, like our church. There are new people attending because of this ministry. Another church uses their buildings on Sunday afternoons. The Christian Homeschool Co-op, does that sound familiar, uses their building. And uh, the Bible study groups and youth meetings use their group. They are all, they're also uh, working with Operation Christmas Child, as we are in this church. So very much like our ministries going on. These are our sister churches in Utah who are faithfully working uh, for the Lord. And that's the reason that this church supports their ministry, their ongoing ministry. He is, he is a dy dynamic speaker. He still, uh, well, I can't remember if he still travels or not, but the last time he came, he was 93. And, uh, and he is, he's wonderful to listen to. If you get an opportunity, he started the publication ministry uh, called the Utah Christian Publications. And if you're interested in learning and comparing Christianity with what Mormons teach, that is a wonderful place to begin. You can look it up and, uh, and learn anything you want to know about his ministry. Thank you. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just uh, thank you for Marv Cowan and his... Uh ministry that he has there in Utah to the Mormon uh, people. Lord, just pray that you would uh, be, with, be with him, continue to bless him and, and uh, that mission. And, and Father, we just pray that you would uh, continue to be with us today. Um, Lord, just open our hearts for that message you've placed on, on Shane's. And Father, just be with us as we continue now in our worship to you. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. There really is a power in learning to practice thanksgiving. Amen? There is a life-changing possibility when we begin to take up and arm ourselves with the principle of walking in thanks to the Lord. And so today we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about arming ourselves with thanksgiving. But before we do... I also kind of like to have fun over Thanksgiving, and I have uh, a return of uh, a game. Can we play a game or a little bit? Is that all right? Is it okay to do games in church? Okay. So we're, this is a game called Thanks for That. Um, you're going to get three choices, A, B, or C. We're going to indicate those with one, two, or three. So your answer, hold it up with your finger, one, two, or three um, is your answer. So we're going to go ahead and try this. Ready? Um, you will see a series of questions asking who we should thank for various things. It's your job to pick the correct answers. So, number one, who do we have to thank for the first smartphone? What do you think? Who do we have to thank for the first smartphone? If you said IBM, you are correct. If you are IBM, you are correct. Okay. Some of you, I don't know if I want to thank them or if I want to throw my fist at them, okay? Um, which U.S. president do we have to thank for declaring Thanksgiving a national holiday? What do you guys think? One, two, or three? One, two, or three? If you said Abraham Lincoln, you are correct. All right. 
Which people group do we have to thank for the invention of paper? Yeah, you guys remember that stuff, young people? It's that stuff that the old folks come out with, with, with pencil. Okay. All right. Here we go. The Chinese. Yes. Yes. All right. Which company should we thank for creating the first pumpkin spice latte? Where's my pumpkin spice people out there? Okay. If you said Starbucks, you are correct. Okay. Who should we thank for painting the Mona Lisa? The Mona Lisa. Who should we thank for painting the Mona Lisa? If you said Leonardo da Vinci, you are correct. Which Native American tribe should we thank for teaching the pilgrims to farm in the New World? To farm in the New World. Which one? I'm going to try to say this Wampanoag. Did I get it? Okay. Um, which country should we thank for coming up with fried chicken? Can I get an amen? Amen. If you said Scotland, you are correct. Okay. Who do we have to thank for inventing American football? American football. What do you guys think? You said Walter Camp. Walter Camp. I heard a yes. Okay. Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph are the guys who thank for this popular video streaming service. This popular video streaming service. What do you guys think? If you said Netflix, you are correct. Which store should we thank for sponsoring the first Thanksgiving Day Parade? Oh, I heard everybody say in Macy's. <laughs> Got you on that one. All right. Thanks for that. Pastor, why on earth did you just take us through that little question here? And here's why. The Bible tells us and is very, very clear that all good things come from God above. Amen? And so if there is any good in our life, we can thank other people, but ultimately all of our thanks goes to God alone. Amen? He is the one who gives us any good thing in our life. So we're going to talk about the power of thanksgiving. Um, what does it mean to practice thanksgiving today? Thanksgiving itself, um, the root word in the Greek, eucharista, does that sound similar to um, what we call the eucharist? The Eucharist has to do with communion. The thing about practicing Thanksgiving often in the Bible is it has to do with sitting down with people and food and giving thanks to the Lord. This happens multiple times in Scripture. It's kind of cool. You know, we know Thanksgiving really is, is an American Western holiday, but it is a concept that is deep within Scripture, deep within Scripture. It's the act of offering thanks or being thankful, usually to God, often connected to provision, deliverance, or God's character, commonly associated in Scripture with meals and worship. Meals and worship. So we're going to kind of Gatling gun different aspects or elements of thanksgiving. Why is it important? And what does the Scripture say? We're going to start all the way back in the Old Testament with the Mosaic Law. Everybody say, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> okay, good. See, I, I brought that back. You guys thought I was done with that. So important. It was so important. So Thanksgiving was so important. This practice of being thankful to the Lord is so important. It was a part of the Mosaic Law in several places. It was to be practiced by the people of, of Israel often and in their annual rhythms, in their monthly rhythms, in their seasons. They were to practice thanks in different ways ways. Let's look at Leviticus, everybody's favorite book we were talking about in Sunday school today. Everybody loves the book of Leviticus and reads through it, no problem. Well, there's some really beautiful nuggets in the, the book of Leviticus. Let's look at it. Levit Leviticus 7, 12 through 13 says, if he offers it for a what? Thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of unleavened bread. 
So this practice of offering thanks to God was something, it was to be given of your own free will, something that you wanted to do, you practiced it, and then when you practiced it, it had stipulations on how you would practice thanksgiving. Um, How many of you have a hard time saying thanks for things? How many of you really notice when people don't thank you for things? How many of you have ever been thanked, but not really in the way you wanted to be thanked? Have you ever had that? You're like, well, that wasn't really a thanks. That's not the thanks that I was hoping for that I wanted. Well, God, God, since in the Old Testament, he he helped coach Israel on how to offer thanks. It was such an important event. It was such an important practice. Why do I keep saying practice? Well, the, the thing about human nature is this. If we don't do something intentionally, if we don't do it on purpose, we tend to forget about it, don't we? How many of you, if it's not in your calendar, you're going to forget about it? How many chores, you don't notice that they're not getting it done until you can't literally turn on your sink, there's so many dishes in it? Is that just me? Oh, okay. So the, the, the kind of the idea then here is that we would practice Thanksgiving. This was at the, the Feast of Weeks. It was an annual practice, typically in the spring, May 25th through the 27th. Um, There were other public ritual occasions, including the inauguration of the temple, where they would have Thanksgiving meal, in a way. Um, There were events on national level that that evoked the, um, if it was a successful conclusion to a military campaign, they would have a practice and have and practice a meal and have thanks. Um, At the end of a famine or a pestilence, did anybody at the end of COVID invite all your friends over and say, let's have a feast, this puppy's over? We never really had that date, did we? But maybe it would be worth it. Confirmation of a, a, lo, um, a candidate to the throne. If there was a new king um, or a time of religious revival, if there was a time where people returned to the Lord, there would be a, a time for meeting in and offering thanks to the Lord and eating with one another. Um, on such as the harvest of the first fruits. Um, so, Very important practice, very Old Testament practice, and one that was done intentionally and on purpose. So on purpose that David himself, anybody remember King David from the Old Testament? I love this passage. David hired full-time thinkers. Can you imagine this job? How cool would it be if you got to be hired to be a full-time thanker of the Lord. He was, a, and let's look at the passage, First Chronicles 16, 4. Then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke and to thank and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. It was so important that it required a full-time personnel for thankfulness. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that can, being paid full-time to give thanksgiving to God? But yet, many of us can't seem to really crunch it in our every day. Am I right? Do you ever have that time of thanks? Do you ever sit down and just spend time worshiping and thanking the Lord? Such an important aspect of our walk with God. And it, it changes us from the inside out. Thanksgiving has the possibility of changing us from the inside out. Let's look at another principle. Thanksgiving is the natural response to receiving grace. To receiving grace. So thanksgiving is the natural response to receiving grace. Um, for those of us who are here who have believed and professed faith, excuse me, in Jesus, have we received an immense amount of grace? Well, does that grace just stop with us or does it affect how we view our world? It changes us, right? The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit indwells us and then he begins to produce these crazy things out of us that we didn't have to begin with or on our own. The Holy Spirit produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. One of those, sorry, one of the fruits that are produced in us when we come to faith is thanksgiving, that we learn how to practice thanks to God. 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 15 says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. So he's talking about salvation, right? Um, we also believe and so we also speak. What does he believe in? 
Well, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? What's the good news, brothers and sisters? Jesus lived the perfect life on this earth. He was, he was fully man and fully God. And he, at the end of his ministry and life, he got on the cross willingly and paid the price for our sins. It says the full wrath of God was poured out on him. That wrath of God was due for us because of our sin. Every generation has walked in sin since Adam and Eve. And so Jesus came and on that cross, he paid the price for all of that sin. And he says, for those who now trust and believe in Jesus, receive that forgiveness, that grace. That's the gospel good news. And so he's saying, if you've received the gospel, if you believe in what Jesus did and making you right with God on the cross, paying the, the price for your sin, then, and uh, here's what he's, he continues on, um, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so all of this is for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more and more people, can I get an amen to that? It may increase, so what is the goal of God's grace? That it may increase what? Thanksgiving to the glory of God. A product of knowing the gospel is thanksgiving, amen? A product of believing and today taking back that trust. How many of you sometimes have to remind yourself of that important truth? Maybe you're in a rough season. Anybody in a rough season? Anybody have a hard time? Do you ever have to sit down and remind yourself that God loved you and paid the price for you? So there is nothing now that you can do to earn God's love more, to earn more of his favor. You can do nothing because he has already poured out on you the same favor that he pours or bestows on a son and daughter of God. Amen? That's worth waking up and saying, yes! Amen! The gospel is, a pro it produces in us this thanksgiving. It's what makes us want to sing worship. It's what makes us want to be generous. It's what makes us have an attitude of goodness in the day. So, let's continue on. Lacking in thanksgiving leads to darkness and sin. Lacking thanksgiving leads to darkness and sin. Let's look at Romans 121. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's a real danger, a real, real danger when we don't walk in the practice of thanks. When we don't walk in that practice of thanksgiving, it leads us into futile thinking, doesn't it? Anybody ever been there? Where it's just, it's bleak. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you don't know if there's hope, and you don't know if God is walking with you, and you just feel overwhelmed. That's where I would say take up thanksgiving. Spend a moment, maybe with a brother or a sister, and even in the darkest of moments, to make sure that your mind doesn't sink into futile thinking, that you don't love foolishness, that foolishness doesn't enter your hearts, and that you become darkened. Anybody struggle with depression? Anybody struggle with anxiety? Thanksgiving defeats both of those things. Thanksgiving defeats both of those things and walks us out of darkness. Thanksgiving is a good replacement for sarcasm and joking. Anybody here like sarcasm and joking? It's how you build friendships, let's be honest. If you had to talk with somebody and not joke, it would be uncomfortable. But what I tend to find or what I tend to see, um, if you see sarcasm, uh, end in its inevitable end, it usually ends in insult, doesn't it? Our culture's really built on sarcasm and joking now, isn't it? Most of us don't have the kind of uh, skills anymore without coarse joking and, and that kind of sarcasm. We don't know how to build relationships, but here it says Thanksgiving should replace that. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 4 says, let there be no filthiness, I pronounce that weird, filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. I know many of you are like, man, I pray that that's what 
doesn't happen at our family gathering this year. Can I get an amen? Which are out of place, but instead, instead, let there be what? Let there be thanksgiving. If you guys have that one family member, or maybe you are that one family member, maybe now is an opportunity that you could structure in some type of thanks. Um, I like to do it. I call it check-in. Many of you have done check-in with me, but I like to just go around and say, hey, what's one thing that you're thankful for? Would you share that with everybody else around you? Um, you could do that within your families. You could have spend a time just saying, man, we had a crazy year. Either it was good or it was bad or everywhere in between, but we could sit and be grateful and name the things that we were thankful for. You ever done that as a family? Maybe around your dinner table. Maybe in a crowd, if you're single, get with a group of friends and just spend some time praising the Lord, practicing thanksgiving, because um, it will build trust in relationships, right? It will build relationships, and it will build those relationships that maybe some of you have been praying that God would give you a connection again with somebody who's maybe you're at odds with in your family, or maybe that person that you're at odds with. What if you spent more time in thanksgiving with them instead of this, the filthiness, foolish, and crude joking? Um, it's a good replacement for that. Thanksgiving is a guard of our peace. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, Philippians 4, 6-7 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about what? But I really like to worry. Anybody out there? I have to think about everything. I can't go to sleep at night because I'm anxious, because I'm worried. But it says, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace, I'm going to say that again, and the peace, say that with me, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you struggle with worrying, with anxiousness, with anxiety, that's okay. By the way, we all tend to be anxious. We all tend to worry. But the Bible's encouragement to us is to replace that anxiety with what? Thanksgiving and prayer. Thanksgiving and prayer. Um, I uh, maybe have told some of you one of my, my favorite kind of acronyms for how to coach myself in my prayer life is an acts prayer. An acts prayer. Have you ever heard this? Acts, standing for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Adoration, God, you're so big. You're so good. Confession, God, I am such a sinner. I, I need you. I need you. I need you. Confession, amen. And then thanksgiving, look, Lord, at what you have done by paying the price for me. Thank you, Lord, for all of the good things. And then supplication, God, would you help those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that are in pain, would you be present with them? That's acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's a good practice if you want to make sure that you stick things into your prayer. Um, so that's a little aside. And it says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So is there going to sometimes be things that you don't get an answer about, but that you can have peace about? Yeah, sometimes things still don't make sense. God, why did this happen? I, it doesn't make sense. You ever had, had that conversation with God? But the peace will guard your heart even in the midst of not knowing. You might not always have the answer. By the way, it always also guards your mind. It guards your mind. So walking in Christ is to abound in thanksgiving. So if you have a walk with God, it's comparable to having thanksgiving. This is Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk with him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in. So to have a walk with God is paired inextricably with thanksgiving, walking in thanksgiving, practicing thanksgiving intentionally. Um, thanksgiving is a sure way to enjoyment of God and really enjoyment of life. Um, if it's kind of that glass half full, glass half empty. How many of you tend to be that glass half empty kind of person? 
Oh, come on, I know some of you. <laughs> right? Glass half full, glass half empty. Thanksgiving, it reminds us that our cup is running over because of the grace and the love of God. Amen? So it's a sure way to enjoyment of life. And here it says, Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now I think about this. When people tend to get started drinking, what are they hoping to do? They feel better, or they're hoping to have some type of enjoyment, or they're so hoping to have some kind of, of fulfillment, something to, to fill them up, something to make them happy, something to make them feel better. Here it says that, that you've got something that's far better, far greater, that will fill you with joy and with, with fulfillment, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving what? Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So being a full-time thanker, whether you're paid for that or not, has the potential to replace these things that tend to be vices for us that have consequences, right? There are many things that promise fulfillment. You're going to see that on all the commercials at the football games and on TV. Am I, amen? They're all going to promise what? If you get this, you'll be fulfilled. You know, if you cheer on our team, you're, you'll be fulfilled. Well, if anybody's been a fan of any team for any length of time, that fulfillment <laughs> doesn't last, right? It doesn't last. But giving thanks to God fills us up with an enjoyment, with a fulfillment that we wouldn't have otherwise. Are you practicing thanks? Are you practicing thanks? Thanksgiving is a cure for false religion. It's a cure for false religion. It says, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Does this sound familiar? Are we seeing this today? Well, he continues, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with what? By those who believe and know the truth, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So essentially, Timothy was dealing with guys that were saying, you don't have everything you need. You got to do things our way. You need to fill up by doing things our way. You should be absent, or uh, you shouldn't enjoy things. You shouldn't enjoy life. It was a, a practice called asceticism. That you, if you were more holy, that you would put things out of your life. You would put food and drink out of your life as much as you could. It was called asceticism, and you were seen as pious or more religious. And these guys were coming in, and they're saying, don't enjoy. Don't enjoy. But here Paul then comes in and says, quit being a drag. He almost, it, you can kind of see that, right? He's like, man, sometimes Christians are so, so worried about what they're saying no to that they forget that God has asked them to say yes to, and that's the enjoyment and worship of God. Amen? The enjoyment and worship of God. By the way, that's the chief end of man. Of course, um, as we know in the Westminster Catechism, it says the chief end of man is to glorify God and what? Enjoy Him forever. Do you enjoy God? Do you enjoy the Lord? His intention for you is to enjoy him in thanksgiving. Isn't that cool? Like, what's your purpose? To maximize my enjoyment, to be optimally fulfilled and satisfied and, and pleasured in the name of Jesus Christ alone, because we know nothing in this earth will satisfy us like who? Jesus alone. You've heard it said maybe that there's a God-sized hole in our heart. Have you heard this? And the only thing that will satisfy it is God himself. God himself. And so um, we see here he's saying if you're not enjoying life, if, you're, if it's a bummer all of the time for you. And now there are, there are seasons that it's okay to be sad as a Christian. You know that, right? It's okay to be sad. 
But even in that sadness, how much more is it important to take up thanksgiving and arm yourself with that? Um, Because it will teach you. Some of you need to be taught how to enjoy things again. Anybody there? Where you've been living in and out, maybe you've coming out of a hard season. Maybe you're coming out of hardship. Maybe you got pain and you got memories in your life, baggage that you're carrying with you. And it's Thanksgiving that God wants to teach you how to have joy again. Anybody there? All of us there at one point or another. Thanksgiving gives the right attitude under peril. See, when we are in those hardship seasons, those really rough moments, and when he had said these things, he took bread, giving Thanks to God in the presence of all he broke, broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food for themselves. You know what's the context of this? Breaking bread and giving thanks? They're on a sinking ship. They're about to, this is Paul, and this is in the middle of a raging storm. And, this, and Paul's already received word that this ship is going down. And what does Paul do? Breaks some bread and he gives thanks. And he trusts and knows that God is going to be with him in that moment. Can you imagine (laughs) in some of the hardest moments of your life, breaking bread with brothers and sisters and giving thanks and understanding that you're going to be okay? Boy, we need that, don't we? We need that. We need that. And so Paul broke this bread and he gave thanks to the Lord. And then there was a shipwreck. And he was okay and God was with him. So what? What does that mean for us? How can we practice Thanksgiving more often, not just once a year? Amen? Not just a November thing. How do we as believers walk in thanks? Well, there's a reason why Baptists love Jesus and food. We love breaking bread. It may show. But let's make it intentional as as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage encourage one another to walk in thanksgiving because it is life-giving. It is life-giving, life-changing when we practice the sort of thanks that can change us from the inside out. If you're wondering where to start, uh, you know, there's many psalms that are called the, the psalms of thanksgiving, thanksgiving psalms. One of my favorites is uh, Psalm 118. It's a song of thanksgiving. Maybe you could spend some time this week cogitating, thinking on, meditating on some of the thanksgiving psalms. I recommend 118. Memorize it. Think, uh, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Practice that thanks in a way that changes you from the inside out. And brothers and sisters, if you arm yourself with thanksgiving, it can change your life. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us. As we do, I want to send you out with the, the challenge to count every blessing, to count every blessing in your life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, God, we have so much to be thankful for. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Would you teach us to have joy again because of our thanksgiving in you? Holy Spirit, would you teach us to let go of our anxiety and to take up thanksgiving in its stead? God, would you help us to let go of coarse joking in order to build relationship and to have the kind of intimacy that instead thanks you, Lord Jesus, that we come around and build one another up in thanksgiving. God, we pray for that in our own hearts, God. For those who are in a a dark spot, those who have experienced suffering, God, I pray that, that you would give them the gift, arm them with thanksgiving or those with thanksgiving around them, that they could start to walk in that hardship with a heart of gratefulness and that would change how they walk in that hardship. God, we pray that for all of our brothers and sisters today. God, thank you so much for our church. Thank you so much for salvation. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.